Um, so why don't, why don't we get started? Uh, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Vincent Sutherland. I'm a assistant professor of clinical law at NYU School of Law and a co-faculty director of the Center on Race and Equality in the Law. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for what promises to be a phenomenal conversation um, with Chris Henning um, uh, about her book, um, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. And if you have not picked up this book, you've you got to pick it up, uh, pick it up right away immediately. It's a phenomenal book. And I want to brag all types about Chris um, and her phenomenal work in this book and just her phenomenal work overall. But first, let me introduce her um, and give you a sense of, of exactly who she is. Um, so Chris is a nationally recognized advocate, author, trainer, and consultant on the intersection of race, adolescence, and policing. Um, she is the Bloom Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic Initiative at Georgetown University Law Center and was previously lead attorney of the Juvenile Unit at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where she's been representing children accused of crime for more than 25 years. Um, she is the co-founder of a number of initiatives to combat racial injustice in the juvenile legal system, including the Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program and a racial justice toolkit for youth defenders. She's also the recipient of a host of awards, including most recently the 2021 Leadership Prize from the Juvenile Law Center. She's written numerous articles and publications about advocating for reform in the juvenile system as a, as a widely respected scholar, advocate, and, and just a wonderful all around person. Um, and, and I'm so grateful for her for joining us and for, for being willing to talk with us about this book. And so Chris, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you, Vincent. You're yeah. phenomenal. I've known you for a long time. I can <laughs> absolutely say you're an excellent advocate and friend, so thank you. Thank you, that's very kind of you. Um, so, so before we kind of dive into the conversation, I actually wanna set the stage by, by, by exploring the problem, but before I do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about your own work as a defender working on behalf of children accused of crimes. And I want to ask you, how did you end up in this particular space? How did you get from where you were to where you are today? Um, so, you know, I grew up in a family that um, really was attentive to at-risk youth. I mean, that was just sort of our, our nature. My mother was in early childhood education and my father, although he was a businessman, he would convene a boys group um, from our church at, uh, at our house on Friday evenings. And so for me, I've always sort of thought about working with, with young people um, who were, to be quite frank, most in need. Um, but I had my aha moment for my career was when I was a freshman in undergrad and I uh, had an apprenticeship at the local prosecutor's office. So if anybody knows me, they might be shocked by that, right? <laughs> um, but I, you know, I was at a local prosecutor's office and I was um, assigned, I specifically asked to be in the juvenile unit. And I will never forget arriving at the courthouse and walking down the hallway to meet the, the assistant DA that I was gonna work with that day. And I saw a line of children being escorted down the hall, chained together by, by their feet and by their arms in a uh, Durham County, North Carolina detention facility. And honestly, I can say that changed my life. I stopped in my tracks because I just had no idea that we in contemporary America, yes, I'm old, but it was you know, well after slavery, <laughs> um, but you know that in contemporary America that we um, treated uh, children that way. And even then um, the children were disproportionately um, black and brown. And so I went into the courthouse with the, the, the assistant DA, and I remember sitting there and pointed over um, across the room. And I said, you know, that's really where I want to be. I want to be there with those kids. Mm -hmm. And she was very gracious. She said, well, I will make sure I introduce you to the defense <laughs> attorney. <laughs> and that's how I, you know, got interested and, and knew that this was a career path. Yeah. Well, th well thank you for sharing that. You know, it's, it's, funny kind of to hear people's origin stories and, and kind of where you get these aha moments. Um, and, and, you know, as, as terrible as that experience must have been, I'm, I'm grateful to it, grateful for it because it, it, it produced, you know, your, your work and, and, and you kind of moving down this path. So, um, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, 
guess I want to ask you, in, in the book itself, um, you, you write that America's obsession with incarcerating Black America begins with Black children, which is an incredibly powerful statement, and I think echoes some of what you experienced and what you saw. And I think one that would generate a lot of agreement in a lot of circles, but also a lot of pushback from some as well. And I'm wondering if you can kind of give us a sense of how that statement plays out on the ground for Black children, and how did you kind of arrive at that conclusion more generally? It's interesting, like sort of listening to the way you link my origin story to this question actually makes me think about it um, from a new lens, um, which is, you know, what I often say is that America has a very long history of failing to treat Black children like children. So from the era of slavery. So we're talking about being in Durham and seeing kids shackled together. But, you know, think about it, right, from slavery um, in, uh, you know, Black children were treated as the the property of the purported master. And then we move forward even into the civil rights era and you can have an Emmett Till who can be lynched at the age of 14 on the word of someone who demonizes him, right? Um, and so in, in really to justify the lynching of an Emmett Till and to justify treating children like property, like inanimate objects, you have to demonize them in some way. So in Emmett Till's case, it's the, he's a threat not only to white America, America, but he's a threat to um, uh, to this particular white woman. Um, and I, I think about the lynching of Emmett Till as much broader than that one case, but as a symbolic statement by white America that we will not tolerate the integration of schools because you know he's he's lynched on the heels of Brown versus Board of Education. So that racial thread is there. I think about um, the the failure to treat black children like children had a very intentional and explicit purpose right in the in both the slavery era and in the civil rights era it was explicitly designed to preserve power to preserve resources and to preserve opportunity for white children and so i mean what I, I say this in the book as well, how incredibly efficient is it? If you want to limit the power and the opportunity of, of an entire community, of black of the black community, what better and more efficient way to do it than to cut off the opportunity of black adolescents, black teenagers. And so I think about some of the early era as being very intentional. And even when we move into the 1990s and we see this temporary uptick in crime, politicians recognize in quite explicit ways that there was um, political advantage to be gained by um, labeling or buying into the pseudoscientific myth that black children were super predators. And I know you write about this, Vincent, um, but it was very intentional using these narratives of fear, narrative of demonization of black children. So we've got all these errors of intentional and explicit demonization. And then today, the, the, the demonization lives on or the criminalization of black youth lives on through the American psyche, that fear, I should say, lives on through the American psyche. So that, you know, people walk down a park today and you see a group of black children and you're afraid. And that happens intra-race as well as, you know, um, externally, um, or, or, you know, intra-race as well as across races, people are afraid of black children. And I argue that it's, it's you know, started in those ex in intentional ways and has become quite um, a part of the ways in which we as a community, as a culture, implicitly um, look at black children. And so I, I think it's, you know, being mass incarceration starts with black children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it feels like something that's so kind of woven into the fabric of, of, of the American ethos, um, yeah. right? And the kind of the way that we live and the way that we experience the world around us. Um, so, it, so it's it's incredibly powerful to think about kind of that long historical arc and just the intentionality with, with which it all kind of started. And emerged, started, right? yes. <laughs> um, and so and so kind of thinking about that and, 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 and understanding that, can you kind of describe for us some some of the ways in which that criminalization, that demonization, that dehumanization plays out kind of on the ground for Black children? What does that look like kind of in a day-to-day -day experience? I know you talk about a lot about experiences throughout the book. I'm kind of wondering if you could share some of that with us. 
Yeah. So, you know, from the broadest strokes, I would say three broad strokes that I can probably looking back at the book can organize it in. Mm -hmm. One is the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors. That means the criminalization of those behaviors, those activities that all of us did when we were kids or as adults that were reading and saying these our children are doing these behaviors, but we would never, you know, um, let our children see the light of day or, or many readers would never let our children see, see a courthouse, you know, in, in, in those ways um, because we don't view them that way. So that's one broad stroke. This, the second um, broad stroke is the hyper surveillance and over policing and aggressive policing of, of black youth. And when I use the word policing here, I'm not just talking about the blue uniform, but I'm also talking about civilians, all of us who are responsible, who engage in the criminalization and hyper surveillance of black children. And then the third care category I think is, is the dehumanization of black children when they do make mistakes. So when they really do commit a crime, um, how do we treat them differently than white children who commit violent acts? I mean, it's, it, you know, they, we, we have managed to figure out a way to show grace um, and forgiveness and tolerance and rehabilitation and redirection when white children engage in serious offenses, but we you know, are ready and eager to transfer black children to adult facilities, so. One thing I want to want to also um, mention as as we're kind of talking is for for those of you in the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A, um, and and we'll do my I'll do my best. We'll save some time at the end, and also you know potentially weave some of them in in throughout our conversation. But please I want to encourage folks to to drop their questions in the Q and A so we can so we can make sure we have a a, a nice conversation in that way as well. Um, Chris, I'm, you know, I, I I love the title of the book, Rage of Innocence. I'm wondering kind of if you can give us a sense of what, what it means and kind of where, 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 it come, where it comes from, how you came up with that. <laughs> well, you know, that's a sort of a, a funny story how I came up with it. I will say this, um, I wanted the book to be Arrested Development from Emmett Till to Tamir mm. Rice. That was going to be the title. Huh, and nice. Right. I thank you. I thought so too. Uh, I got so much pushback on that, both from the publishing house and from a few friends. One with Arrested Development being the popular television show that I must admit, you know, I was I didn't watch. And so it didn't, you know, strike me as being problematic. But so there was pushback there. They didn't want any confusion with that. And then I could not believe this, Vincent. But my editor at the publishing house said to me that there are people in the world who do not know Emmett Till or Tamir Rice. And that if you, I know, I had the same reaction. And if you really want to engage your audience, to engage a mass press, uh, um, a mass you know, audience to engage around this topic, I should say, then you need, a t you need another title. I, I just was blown away by that. So we, you know, continued, I continued to look for titles and ultimately the rage of innocence is the rage that every single one of us should have when any one child is deprived of the opportunity to be a child. That said, there are a number of nuances with the title and the most important nuance, um, I believe, is the fact that the rage of innocence is the rage that Black children have when they are told over and over and over again that they are criminal, that they're to be feared, that they are a threat. Um, and and I, I say that any child, any person with an ounce of self-respect, an ounce of dignity, an ounce of self-worth pushes back, should push back on those labels and try to assert themselves and stand up for themselves. And so I think that's what Black children do. They resist these labels. And what does it sound like? You know, it, it doesn't sound like a little dissertation. Mr. Officer, I'm disappointed in the way that you're treating me. No, it sounds like a teenager. And we know that teenagers are impulsive and reactive and emotional, and it sounds aggressive at times. Um, and so I, I, I think that for me is a huge piece of the book and I have a chapter you know called contempt of cop <laughs> and it's all about the ways in which you know black children have learned to you know resist um, those labels in whatever ways um, that it looks like including rage if you will yeah yeah um so so one thing I'm kind of 
curious about and thinking about like the the um the ways in which black children are are criminalized and 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 another thing you write about in the book is kind of the subject of like police and schools yes. right and um and of course that's a, that's a, a huge site of this criminalization a huge site of where these kind of challenges and issues arise and i think i guess one thing i want you to do if you maybe you can kind of speak to kind of this historical arc of, of, of police and schools and kind of how that came about because you make these these great historical connections between yeah. uh, the civil rights era and post brown and the rise of police and schools and then i guess the other piece for me that was surprising was was i was always thought about police and schools as something that came about as a result of columbine and the reaction to columbine and mm. you know the need for like school security and of course people can come in and shoot up a school we need to have you know, some armed force in there to stop that from happening. And that's, I think, the popular narrative. But I think what, what we learn in your book is that's not actually not actually the case. So I'm wondering right. if you can speak to that. It, it's not the full story. And I will say it's one of the things that I learned in writing the book, because Vincent, absolutely. I went into this book, to be quite frank, thinking about, um, you know, police and schools as a part of the often repeated narrative that we have police um, because parents and teachers were afraid to send their children to school after Columbine, which took place in 1999. But as I dug deeper, it became clear from the, the, the record that the first police officers in schools appeared in 1939 at the earliest conversations about the earliest inkling of the possibility <laughs> that there might be integration um, in the school system, right? Um, and then the, the number of, of police in schools increases exponentially in that civil rights era when, uh, uh, you know, and of course we know that folks said that police went to schools to facilitate a safe passage or to facilitate um, a meaningful integration in schools. But we know both again from the record and from even iconic photographs that so often police officers became the impediment to meaningful integration of schools. Um, and then this is what I, I just found significant by 1991, right? And eight full years before Columbine, we have the creation or the establishment of the National Association of School Resource Officers. That means there were enough officers, you know, in this country, in schools, you know, having conferences, having training curricula, philosophy, mission, and the like in 1991 before Columbine ever happened. 1994 comes along. We've already talked about the 1990s, right? That's that uptick in crime and the height of the, uh, or the, the beginning of the, the super predator myth. Um, and in 1994, we have the federal cops in schools program is created. And I should say the, I should say the program, the federal cops in schools funding framework is created. It's, you know, there. Um, and then Columbine happens five years after that. And yes, there is an increase in federal funding into uh, the federal cops and schools program, but the framework was there. And here's what's most important. What happens in, in 1999 and thereafter when there is an increase in federal funding, police officers get sent where? They get sent to schools with it a predominantly or with a higher percentage, I should say, of black and brown children. They didn't get sent to the Sandy Hooks and the Columbines. Mm. Um, but today we've got, we know that, you know, uh, black and brown children are far more likely than white children to attend a school with a school resource officer. We also know that more police in schools means more arrest in schools, more arrest in schools means more arrest of black and brown children in schools. Um, at significantly disproportionate rates. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I guess one thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about is the, the, the way that kind of police behave, is it, is it because they just don't have any training? Is it because they've been, you know, is it because they're, they're, they've been kind of uh, reared in a society that has this kind of antipathy toward black youth? Like, what do you think, what do you think are kind of at the roots of, 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 of that space? Or is it kind of the, the historical arc you, you spoke to before about kind of what, what do we think about controlling families? So I think it's a great question, Vincent. I think the answer is both. And I, I, and I say both as someone who has been a juvenile defender, a youth defender now for, you know, 26 years. And so I think about it from the adolescent development lens before putting race aside for a moment, yeah. that police officers are ill-equipped 
um, quite ill-equipped to engage with young people. Um, there was a study that's quite old, and so we need some updated research, um, but I think it was, uh, uh, I want to say earlier in the 2000s, but there was a report that showed that less than 1% of police departments had training on adolescent development, right? Mm -hmm. There was a much more recent report, either 2018 or 2019, whereby the um, uh, officers in, in schools were surveyed and they report that they had very little training. Well, they had, um, I would say like maybe I don't know, 60% of the officers who were stationed in a school um, had not had um, adolescent brain training, adolescent uh, brain development training. Um, mm -hmm. Officers had not had de-escalation training. Officers had not had training in psychosocial uh, features of adolescence. Um, officers had not been trained in um, uh, special education needs and mental health. So I say that to say putting race aside, um, police officers are woefully ill-equipped to be in schools. Um, very few uh, memoranda of, upper, of understanding have been established across the country between police officers and schools. And when they do exist, they really are speaking to often cost allocation, who's gonna fund what, and very little about what role the officer should play, what minimum training they should have, um, things of that nature. So that in and of itself is a problem. Then yes, your question is, is it, um, does this historical arc racial art that we've been talking about play a role? And the question is absolutely unequivocally, right? Um, you know, police officers, um, like all of us, right? All of us live with the implicit biases, implicit fears about black and brown children. Um, and so you send police officers into schools, um, you, in, you have officers who engage with black and brown youth with cognitive disabilities. Um, and the research shows that young people with behavioral and cognitive disabilities um, look impulsive and aggressive, even though they have disabilities. And without that training, the implicit racial bias exacerbates that, right? Um, and so, I mean, we could talk forever about the implicit biases about black children, um, uh, both police officers and civilians perceive black children to be older than they are, actually are by 4.5 years, this sort of phenomena of adultification that Dr. Philip Atiba Golf talks about. Um, there's research showing that, um, uh, that folks perceive black youth in groups as more dangerous than um, white youth in groups. Um, you know, research showing that folks perceive black, uh, uh, both youth and adults as heavier, stronger, uh, more muscular than they actually are. So you've got all of that in the school context um, that, that exacerbates this, this notion of the intersection, I would say, between racial bias and adolescence. And then the triple intersection between racial bias, adolescence, and disability, and you've got racial disparities that are off the charts. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess, you know, adding another layer to it, which I think you, you do so kind of wonderfully throughout your book, I think so much of the focus, a lot of the conversations around race and youth and criminality centers on, on Black boys, but you're very intentional throughout the book to give kind of an equal accounting of impacts of these phenomena on black girls and on black LGBTQ youth as well. And so I'm wondering kind of what unique insights we gain from the way you approached it, approached this kind of phenomenon from that, from those lenses. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I was indeed very, very intentional about the, the, the placement of girls. I and mean, there was a lot of conversation when I started writing the book, well, are you gonna have a chapter on girls? And I'm like, no, actually, you know, I would like to, to the greatest extent possible, and it proved to be quite possible, to weave the girl stories into every single chapter of the book, right? So if I'm talking about cops in schools, there's as many, you know, girl stories as boy stories and, um, you know, criminalization of adolescent culture. There's as many girl stories, hopefully, as, as, as not hopefully, but unfortunately, as, as boy stories. And, and really what I found was that the, the implicit bias that we just talked about, the stereotypes, the tropes, um, the myths and the narratives about black children um, applied 
equally to black girls. And so this notion of adultification, there was research showing not only did we perceive as a society black boys older than they actually are, but black girls were perceived to be more knowledgeable, um, more adult-like, less innocent, less in need of protection. Um, you know, all of these things that we consider important when we think about childhood and adolescence and innocence, right? Um, so that was uh, as, a, as a first layer um, of it all. But then even beyond that, the stories that are to be told about the collateral consequences, right? The impact of mass incarceration on Black girls means that Black girls are being raised in many instances with, you know, Black men and uncles and fathers and brothers and cousins ripped from the community, ripped from their homes, and thinking about what that collateral consequence has. Um, thinking about use of force um, and the number of, you know, stories, you know, like Makia Bryant and the nine-year-old girl um, in, in um, Brooklyn who was um, uh, pepper sprayed um, and held down in the snow. I mean, I was shocked at the number of stories and how easily off the top of my head, I could capture those high profile stories. Um, and as you know, you know, from reading the book, Vincent, my story weaves together stories um, voices of my own clients from Washington, D.C., as well as these um, well-known narratives um, from others. And it was just easy. There was not a chapter in which I could not easily and naturally identify the ways in which girls had been impacted. And of course, in some unique ways, the hypersexualization of Black girls and the ways in which police officers view them from a sexual lens and the presumptions that were being made about Black girls and the failure of detention facilities and other facilities across the country to be attentive to the unique girl, uh, um, uh, needs of girls in detention. And so I talk about, you know, the suicide when I got to that chapter, you know, uh, about, you know, young kids taking their own lives in detention facilities. There were stories of girls who did the same thing. And it's just, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's really, you know, incredibly heartbreaking, like throughout, um, and in so many ways. And I guess that kind of brings me to another set of questions I want to ask you, um, you know, in thinking about criminalization and dehumanization and kind of with respect to Black youth, I'm wondering if you talk about like how that affects youth themselves, um, you know, when you think about their lives, their interactions with police, interactions with the justice system, kind of how you see those effects and impacts playing out in your own experiences representing children, Black children. So uh, another great question and um, another place where I learned a ton. I'll start with a story that I open, um, I think uh, chapter nine with policing as trauma. I devoted an entire chapter on that for no other reason than just the tremendous psychological impact it has on black or brown children. But I, I really had another aha moment. I was actually sitting in this very office before the pandemic and uh, the phone rang. Um, it was uh, one of my law students in the clinic answered the phone, but I was right there. And it was our client. And the, our client said, is there a warrant for my arrest? And we thought it was the oddest question because we had just been in court the day before. Had there been a warrant, you know, we certainly would have known about it. The police would have executed it right there um, in, in the courthouse. So we just thought it was odd. Um, and he, uh, we asked him more questions and he uh, told us that he was he had been sitting in the window of his of his um, home looking out and he could see a police car with two officers sitting in it and he said that the officers had been sitting out there um, uh, for for a couple of hours and he was convinced that if he went outside that they were going to arrest him that they were outside waiting for him that's what he told us and we could hear his mother in the background yelling at him boy you're just being paranoid you're just being paranoid and i remember putting my head down and saying he's not paranoid he is literally traumatized um this was a kid that i you know had been representing with three rounds of students for you know several years and uh he had been stopped just more than 50 times in his 17 years. And so, yes, I've been representing him. Guess what, y'all? I was representing him on marijuana charges, okay? Marijuana charges, not you know serious offenses. And this child had been um, uh, stopped by the police far more times, far more times than 
he had ever done anything wrong. Moreover, he was stopped in so many bad stops, meaning illegal stops, that the prosecutor's office um, really um, had dismissed more cases of his than they had prosecuted um, because of all the bad stops. And so that really led me to do some additional research around the traumatic effects of policing, only to find out that there's this growing body of empirical research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma that black and brown children experience during their adolescent years in contact with police. Um, and the research was showing that, you know, black and Latinx youth who were living in heavily surveilled neighborhoods or were the frequent uh, targets of stops and frisk um, reported high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, um, they became hyper vigilant, meaning that they're just always on guard and not trusting uh, police officers and that distrust of police officers was transferring over to other adult authority figures like teachers, counselors, probation officers when they were in the system and even us as defense counsel. So when I do trainings and conversations with the defense bar, I remind them that, that even we might see that. What's so fascinating about the research is that it shows that the trauma occurs not just from being the direct target of that kind of police contact, but also hearing about it or witnessing it, um, um, involving friends and family and other people that you're close to. And of course, we all know from watching the murder of George Floyd on television, right, or on whatever we watched it on, that, um, that even involving people that we don't know, watching those kinds of violent events um, takes its traumatic toll on black and brown children. And I get people all the time, I say, stop and remember how you felt. I remember crying. It took me days to get up the nerve to watch, you know, what people were texting me and telling me I had to watch with the killing of George Floyd and how, you know, just devastating it was for me. And I just say, remember, you know, imagine what it would be like to be a young black child, a young black boy in particular, um, who knows that this could be me too. Um, and how different that is. So it's it's a profound effect. And I'll just say one more thing, Vincent, about children who then live these experiences in their neighborhood and then go to school. Yeah. And you walk into school and you see, you know, a blue uniform greeting you at the door, somebody with a weapon at the door, somebody running you through a metal detector. And so literally schools have become an extension of that policing in many black and brown communities. Yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember, at one portion of the book, you talked about kind of visiting visiting one of your clients, your child client schools, and it felt yes. much like, like the, the the kind of the the link between being searched and and, and scrutinized when you walk into a prison or a jail was yep. was almost direct with respect to the way you treated when you're walking into a school, and it's just like, absolutely. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, like literally going to our local detention facility, the check-in procedure was virtually identical to going to the local school. And I just was, you know, really, when you have these aha moments and begin to think mm -hmm. these things through, this is really, you know, really traumatic. And, you know, sometimes when I give, you know, talks or have conversations with folks, the number of folks who don't live in communities like that or um, don't realize that kids today in many pockets of our country go to school um, with, with school police officers. I'm always surprised when that's surprising to other people. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and you know, there's also this piece of it and I'm wondering kind of, it, it, it feels like, and I think you write about this extensively, the fact that, you know, Black children just you can't trust the police, cannot trust these systems, and just are being kind of constantly beat down by these by these systems. Um, and kind of how much that must undermine just their ability to kind of navigate the world around them. It's just really kind of shocking in a lot of ways. Yeah, and and you know that was another thing I think. Um, like putting my head around for purposes of writing the book, I ended up writing a chapter um, on adolescent or black adolescent identity development, right? Yeah. Not realizing until I dug in just how impactful these police encounters. And again, policing both in the, in the blue uniform, but all of us who police and fear black children, but how those um, have, a, have an effect on one of the most important things that happens during your adolescent years. That is your, your identity development, your sense of who you are, what you can become, and uh, how you fit into the world is shaped 
by these encounters, by these messages, both implicit messages and explicit messages. And so how incredibly you know, difficult it is for a parent you know, to navigate this, what they call racial socialization. How do you help your kids um, navigate these negative messages and while at the same time be healthy, well-developed, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, young person who becomes an adult with self-esteem um, yeah, and yeah. a sense of what they can accomplish in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to, I want to spend a few minutes kind of exploring your, your, you know, very personal connection to, to the book in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. Um, you, you talked earlier about how you, you, you were able to weave in stories from your own experiences representing young people. And I'm wondering how you decided or chose which client's stories to tell. Mm. Uh, that's, I mean, you, you've represented just a whole host of, of, of young people over the course of your career. And so I'm wondering, how did you, how did you pick and choose between who you, whose stories you wanted to tell and what you wanted to tell about them? Yeah, so I, you know, um, almost didn't realize I was doing this until um, many years later. But before I was at Georgetown, I was at the DC Public Defender Service, you know, representing kids there. And then I came to Georgetown and continued in our clinic. And throughout all those 26 years, though, I, you know, I think the stories that I tell only date back to 10, 10 years or, or, or more recent. Um, but during that, uh, is that accurate? That may not be accurate, actually. Maybe some, some. Oh, I know why. Um, my the, the white children that I represented are that old, <laughs> are way back in history. Yeah. Um, but here's the deal: that throughout my career, I um, was keeping a folder of what I call shock and all cases. And I actually, when I talk to law students, so if any law students are out there in the audience, it's such an important thing to help us not become complicit, to help us, you know, to stay aware and to stay alert, but keeping a file of those cases that I was always bothered by. Why in the world is this case in the system? Why is this child, you know, here in this courthouse in the first place? And so I, I have been collecting those. And I think many of those cases, the, the, the case that I opened the book with, with the exception of the white children that I've represented, I think that's right, you know, is the oldest story in the book, and that's about, you know, 10 or 11 years old, um, was one of the most, you know, shocking cases that I have of this kid who makes the Molotov, or makes something that looks like a Molotov cocktail, and then gets, you know, arrested, and, you know, um, and ends up in a nine-month ordeal when he literally was just a 13-year-old kid watching a movie and thought it looked cool. He wasn't trying to blow up the school, and he told the school, you know, he had it in his book bag by accident, wasn't trying to blow up the school. Nobody gave him the benefit of the doubt. And let me be clear, there was, for those of you who haven't read the first chapter, there was no liquid in that bottle that was, was, um, that was flammable. The, the, um, the, the wick that he chose was a piece of toilet paper that would never catch on fire yet, or never, never um, light the liquids inside on fire. And, um, but yet he was arrested prosecuted and in court for nine months. And sometime after I watched, uh, or I, I represented um, Eric is what I call him, I went to Connecticut and I was giving a talk. And, at the, uh, and I told that story in the talk. And at the end of that talk, a white woman came up to me and said, my son did the exact same thing. And I was blown away. And I said, well, what happened to your son? And she said, they put him in advanced science classes advanced science classes because he was creative. So for me, that was the ultimate shock and awe case. That was my real aha moment. So you ask the question, how do I figure out what stories? Many of the stories come from that folder, those cases that I had been storing over the years that really bothered me. But here's the deal. I would then like look at a story. I pull back old police reports and I would look at them and then it would, uh, and it would spark some research. So I would go off and I would do some em empirical research on trauma, for example. And then that trauma research would remind me of another client. So it actually was really, Vincent, so incredibly easy um, to, to figure out which cases, because there are so many cases that fit the research and so much of the um, uh, the, the research helped explain things that I didn't understand about what was going on with my clients. So I don't know if that's yeah. a satisfactory answer, yeah. but if you keep a shock and all case, 
um, I think I think you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And, and just to be clear, there, there was a question in the Q and A about the race of the child, the, the child in Connecticut. Um, oh, I'm sorry, white child, white child. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I should have assumed, but I did <laughs> not. Um, thank yeah. you for asking that. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, and and just kind of sticking with your with your personal experiences, you you, you explore some very very personal experiences in the book, especially as it really related to your own family and you do so from such an incredibly powerful and deeply vulnerable place and I'm wondering kind of how did you decide to go about sharing your own family's experiences um, uh, in this in this book and kind of how those experiences shape your reflections on your work both looking backwards and looking forward yeah it's a, you know it was incredibly um, painful to write those sections that are um, autobiographical. So what Vincent is alluding to is the fact that I talk about my brother uh, among other um, things, but my brother being in the system um, more than just being in the system. he actually died in the um, in the in the criminal legal system. So um, I you know I share that pretty early on for those of you reading that. but I I, I will say, um, it's really hard to be a black um, a person in America and to not be directly impacted by the criminal legal system in some way or another. Um, and my family was no different. I mean, I don't care how much education you have, you know, what class, you know, we grew up um, by the time, uh, we didn't always, but by the time I think my brother and I um, were were in in high school. We were relatively, you know, middle class middle class for a southern uh, small town, <laughs> right? So it's all relative. But we were relatively middle class, and none of that shielded us from the impact and the touch of the criminal legal system. Um, and so, um, and you asked the question, like, how did you decide? I, I'll be honest with you. So I talk about my brother probably the most in chapter 11. And the chapter is about um, uh, the Black family in the era of mass incarceration. And as I was writing that story or writing the stories in that, I'm talking about the Khalif Browders and Vernita Browders of the world. I'm talking about all of the, the, the parents, you know, Jordan Edwards' parents, Jordan Davis's parents, Trayvon Martin's parents, Tamir Rice's mother, Samiri Rice. I'm talking about all these, you know, women and fathers, mothers and fathers and um, grandparents who have lost. And I was so heavy, Vincent, just so incredibly heavy. It's almost, you know, hard to talk about even now. And I was really intentional about voice. And I felt like I could not tell their stories without hearing from them. And so what I did was force myself to listen to documentaries and video clips and original. I wanted to hear their voices talking about their experiences. And that's what I was using to write that, that section in that chapter. And as I wrote, I realized just how much of my own story, you know, um, was mapping onto that or my own experiences was on that. Um, and so chapter 11 was the hardest part to write. It was probably the last like, you know, you know, uh, place that I that I finished. Um, and I remember in part because I, I needed to tell my younger brother who's still alive, right, what that I was writing that and I wanted to share that with him first before um, before I actually published the book. And so I felt like my publisher was like, okay, you better get this book in. <laughs> but I was struggling to get through that. And it was very difficult. You know, I cried a lot in, in I had nightmares and, you know, reliving all of that. So, um, but I think it was more, uh, it was important um, to be vulnerable and to be honest. Um, and just to show, I, I think the where I landed was that um, I am clear that class, socioeconomic class, does not help you avoid, as a Black person, the criminal legal system, but that poverty makes it worse, if that makes it right. And so that my clients who were indigent and, and you know, living in housing developments and housing projects experienced it far differently and in many ways you know, uh, worse, if you will. I don't want to you know, do a comparative, but um, experienced it differently. And so that's what I, I ultimately concluded with that chapter. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, just incredibly powerful. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the last bit of time we have left, you know, I want to I want us to kind of leave on some hopeful 
yeah. more hopeful <laughs> notes. And so I'm kind of curious. I want to, I want to, and we have a few questions in the in the Q and A in the chat. And so I want to explore with you. What do you see as kind of solutions, um, and and what do solutions look like to this incredibly vexing problem? Um, and, and I guess what I'm specifically thinking about is um, a couple of things. Um, you know, we, we've talked about, um, and you've taught, you recounted with with a lot of eloquence and grace, the kind of myriad challenges that come at the intersection of race and youth and criminalization and dehumanization. And we've talked about how much damage is wrought by the criminal legal system and police and prosecutors and judges and all these other actors and schools um, uh, within the system. So I'm wondering kind of what solutions look like um, when, when we kind of consider all, all of those challenges. Um, what do you think are kind of the, the, the most important things that we that we can be doing, not only as advocates, um, but as, as, as a society when we think about these issues? So I think the, the hardest part, right? The thing that we need to do most is the hardest thing, which is, is the cultural shift and that narrative shift is really important. Um, and that's for all of us being honest about our fears, that honest about the why we fear black and brown children as we walk through the park at night. Um, uh, and then what we as individuals can do to start shifting that narrative. And it starts with, you know, getting proximate with black and brown youth who um, are the most, particularly those black and brown youth who are most likely to be targeted, those in lower income communities and, um, uh, and, and figuring out how to offer that support. And I think by becoming proximate, whether whatever role that is, gives you an opportunity to then share their stories. It is precisely because I work so closely with, with, um, with Black children in Washington, DC, that I understand, one, that they are just children. And they are silly, even when they commit serious crime. They are just children like I was, like you were, like you know our own children are, um, and that they you know, have been demonized in, in so many ways. Um, so that's one thing is that cultural shift, but that's harder, um, what we got to do it. In the meantime, though, I'm a pragmatist, I'm a lawyer, I'm an af activist. And so that means I want to be, you know, on the ground in front of city council, in front of state legislators, um, talking to prosecutors, judges, probation officers, school boards, um, and thinking about um, reform in th three broad strokes, one, three or four broad strokes. I mean, I think one is, you know, radically reduce the footprint of police officers in the lives of all children, and particularly black and brown children who have been disproportionately criminalized. Um, and so that means several things like police free schools. I'm a proponent of it. And, and it's not as radical as it sounds, right? It doesn't mean that police won't be available um, to, to, uh, to, to respond at the ready to an appropriate 911 call um, or even some system of communication, rapid fire communication between the police and the school. Schools, um, but when we have police on site, right, they're not uniquely trained, as we've already talked about, police, uh, excuse me, uh, school officials, teachers default to police officers as the, the standard for discipline, routine school discipline. We need to decriminalize certain behaviors. We need to, there should not, no child should be charged with, the, there's a, a crime on the books called disturbing schools right, created specifically for kids who are disorderly in school, right, that in my mind is a crime of being a, a kid, right, yeah. so let me just arrest you for being loud, impulsive, disorderly, um, so those kinds of offenses, and there are many uh, of those that are similar, um, beyond that, I think we need to, um, where police do in the rare circumstances, when police officers do engage with young people, that we need to have uh, 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 officers who are developmentally trained. Um, that means training in adolescent development, training in de-escalation, training in, you know, in, uh, racial bias or adolescent race equity is what we're, we're calling it when I go and talk to police officers and um, prohibitions on use of force, things that we should never have to regulate. You know, I, I, it's sad that I have to tell a police officer not to use handcuffs on someone under the age of 12, right? Like that nine-year-old. And in, 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 I think I said Brooklyn, I meant Rochester. I think I, I forgot where she's from, but but the nine-year-old, um, you know, it's just it's just it's sad. Um, 
I also think about um, a comprehensive set of regulations, accountability, and training uh, for police officers. And I think about also uh, implementing evidence-based strategies or responses to even the most serious offenders. Right. So we haven't even I know our time is almost done. And we talk about the ways in which as somebody put in the chat, Roberta put in the ways in which we coddle, you know, white adolescents and then we criminalize and we penalize um, black youth. I think about the difference between Kyle Rittenhouse and Tamir Rice is the epitome of that. Right. Yeah. You know, that, you know, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior was a quintessential, quintessential adolescent you know, what I call foolishness, right? You know, it's a 17 year old who, you know, crosses state lines with a gun in public with minimal experience with, with weapons. Why does he go? Because he's impulsive and reactive and his friends call him and say, come on over. Precisely, they've got the gun, they're waiting for him. You know, so he's there with his friends and he gets in over his head um, because he's an adolescent and he finds, you know, that he has to take someone's life. He kills two people, right? And, um, and, and severely injures another. And what does he want? He and his mother and his lawyer, understandably, you know, want the whole world to see him as an adolescent who basically got in over his head and had no choice but to defend himself. And what happens? He gets not only, he gets his life, right? Because he doesn't get killed on the spot. He gets due process. And then he gets found not guilty. By contrast, Tamir Rice, being a child, playing with a toy gun in a park and gets shot dead within less than three seconds of, of police arriving on the scene. And I just think that's really the epitome of, of what's happening. So I digress, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's incredibly powerful and I'm, I really, really appreciate kind of your, your, your thoughts about it. And I guess, you know, just in the, in the few minutes we have left, I have, I guess, two questions I'm going to try and get in. One is, you know, I have, a, I have a four-year-old daughter, I have an eight-year-old nephew I'm, who I'm raising, and I'm increasingly worried about how the world is going to respond to them. Um, yeah. And I have this feeling and sense that basically, you know, for all the reasons you, you've described and all the things you've written about, living in a world that just does not want them to be free, um, quite frankly. And I'm wondering kind of what advice you have for parents um, who are trying to help and, and, and caretakers of young children, of, of young black children who are trying to help their children navigate the, this world around them like what would you say what do you what do you say to what them? do I say and so I get asked this a lot and it's it actually harkens back to what I started but didn't finish earlier um which is how incredibly difficult it is to walk the tightrope of on the one hand as a black parent preparing your child for those inevitable moments of discrimination of racial bias and sometimes even violence um while not over preparing them um to believe Believe that the world has no allies or to, to over prepare them since they live with this trauma that I talked about, right? Because they're afraid all the time. So it's that really delicate balance. And so what, what you know, the research, and this is in chapter five, the, you know, Black Adolescent Identity Development, it's, it's this ways in which the research talks about offsetting. You have no choice as a Black parent, but to prepare them. You just don't. Um, but how do we offset that with very positive, affirming messages about Blackness, right, is one of the ways in which you offset that. And, and introducing your young people to ways um, in which they can give voice um, so creating safe spaces, I guess I'm saying, for them to speak up for themselves, right? So that they don't find themselves cussing the police officer out, but that there are other forms for which they can express themselves is, is one. But it, uh, another one is, is um, you know, research showing that positive affirming Black history, giving them messages that, yes, there will be these messages thrown at you and have been in the, the American lexicon for the entirety of, of the country's evolution, but that at the same time, there's always been black success, black resilience, black, you know, um, and so that's one I think you have to do. Also too, it's like um, it, making sure you're open and honest about the trauma. How do you feel when you see police officers? And, you know, we've seen all kinds of videos. There's this fabulous video, somebody, fabulous but disturbing video somebody showed me where, a uh, uh, from Ring. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but father was watching his son um, or later watching a Ring video of his son um, outside in the front yard playing basketball. 
a police car drives by and the kid hides behind the car, the family car. And when the father sees the um, sees the ring video, he says to his son, well, what were you doing? Why did you do that? And he was like, oh, oh but they might've shot me. Like, I mean, that's a moment, right? But creating space to have these conversations with your kids about not just be afraid, be prepared, but how can we work through the trauma? And please know that, you know, you are powerful and resilient and we're going to get through this together. And in like the 60 seconds we have left, I want to ask you kind of what, what, what keeps you going? What gives you hope? Um, you've been on the on the front lines of this battle for a really really long time. You have given such a, a thorough kind of cataloging and exploration of, of the range of challenges that Black youth face. Um, you know, at, at, what 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 gives you what what, what keeps you hopeful about yeah. about what what tomorrow might bring? So I would say this: it, it, it is, and I start the book and I say at the end of the book I'm going to give you some hope. <laughs> and in chapter twelve, I try to offer that up. And I think. There, there are two things. One, it's it's adolescent resilience and adolescent or youth activism are two things that give me hope. I feel like more than ever before, um, young people are speaking up for themselves and taking um, a stand on things like, uh, you know, uh, police free schools and um, getting to the table. I had a fabulous, I was at a, a youth event this weekend and sitting and talking with some of the young people and they just had some fabulous ideas about, um, uh, about what to do. It's not that they don't want their schools to be safe, but how to get there. And they were talking about social emotional learning, which is one of the best practices for for you know, keeping kids safe and teaching them conflict resolution, leadership, empathy, all these things. And they have this particular student I was talking to, she has, a, she attends a school with social emotional learning. And she was just sitting there telling me just casually, you know, and they could improve that. And she just started naming ways they could improve, you know, the time of day in which that course is taught. And, you know, it needs to be more interactive. And I was like, oh my God, if people would just sit down with her and just listen to what kids have to say about how to make all of the, the aspects of their lives and of their schooling better, that's youth activism, giving voice. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful there. And just knowing that youth are adolescent if you know and out in this way I know people who've ever heard me speak I like to say this a, a psychologist friend taught me <clears throat> this term that I have just fallen in love with <clears throat> which is that every single child needs at least one irrationally caring adult and that every child would do better with a team of irrationally caring adults. And so I think that's what resilience is all about, us being that irrationally caring adult for some black or brown child so that they can be resilient. And I think that's where my hope lies. Chris, thank you so, so much. You've given us so much to, to think about and so much to chew on. And, and, and I really can't can't thank you enough for, for joining us and really for, for, for just giving us a whole host of things to think about. Um, just a phenomenal conversation. and. Um, I continue to be a, a huge, huge, huge fan of, of your work. Um, just, just bravo all the way around. And folks, you gotta, gotta, gotta go out and get this book. Um, it, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you, um, so, thank so you thank Vincent, you. and thank you to your entire, you know, center. I love what you all are doing. Thank you to Deborah Archer, all of you for doing great work. So thank you. Thanks so me. much. Thanks so much, and thanks to all of you for for joining us out there. Um, looking forward to seeing you in our next event, and uh, have a, have a wonderful evening.